After studying this module, you shall be able to know the various principles of management, learn about the functions of management, identify the various kinds of human behavior that exist in an organization. Management is an art of getting things done through people. Thus, a manager should know his people well in order to manage them effectively. To know people well and to effectively manage them, a manager should have good knowledge about the functions and principles of management. Also, he should have an understanding of individual and group behavior which is so vital in achieving the organizational goals. Now, we will study about the principles of management. Principles are statements or truths that provide guidance for human thinking. A principle carries the feature of universal applicability as well. These are required in organizations which are run by human beings. The employees have to work and coordinate with each other and during the course of their work they have to make decisions which not only affect the organization goals but also affect their interpersonal relationships. To take the right decisions and to work in harmony, principles are required. They are the guiding force for employees, particularly managers who have to lead and direct people under him. Let us discuss some of the characteristics of management principles. The first characteristic being dynamic. The management principles are quite flexible and are subject to change with time because the world is dynamic and in order to be successful, the organizations have to adapt themselves with this changing environment. The next characteristic being generalizations. The management principles are not based on scientific analysis. They are general ideas which evolve from human experience and analysis. The third being relative. Management principles are not absolute laws. Hence, they may not be applied in all situations. Their application depends on organizational requirement and situation. The fourth being universal. Management principles are quite universal in nature as they can be applied in all kinds of organization. After discussing the features and characteristics of principles of management, we shall now be discussing some of the important principles which are used and followed in organization all over the world. The first is Henry Fiol's Principles of Management. Henry Fiol was a French mining engineer who for the very first time gave 14 principles of management. According to him, these principles could be used in all types, functions, sizes and levels of management. Given below are the 14 principles of management. Division of work. This principle focuses on specialization of work. Specialization of work leads to employee efficiency and more productivity. Next, authority and responsibility. It is very important that managers have the power to give order to their subordinates and the subordinates have the obligation to fulfill the task given to them. Hence, authority is the power that managers exhibit and responsibility is the obligation that employees shoulder. Next, discipline. It is very important that employees abide by rules and regulations that govern an organization. The obedience of employees towards rules and agreements that bind them is called discipline. Next, unity of command. Employees should receive orders from only one boss and not several bosses. Next, unity of direction. One manager should have only one plan for a series of activities that have same objective. Next, subordination of individual interest to the general interest. The organizational interest supersedes all individual interest. Hence, the interest of organization should be above the interest of the individuals working in an organization. Next, remuneration. 
employees should be given fair wage for their work. Next, centralization. Centralization decreases the subordinate's role in decision making process as most of the decisions are taken by the manager or the top management. Next, scalar chain hierarchy. The line of authority flows from top to bottom through which all communication flows. Next, order. People placed in organizations should be put in the right place at the right time. Next, equity. Managers should be unbiased and therefore should treat their subordinates fairly. Next, stability of tenure of personnel. The employees should be given security of job. This will bring in them long-term commitment for the organization. Next, initiative. The employees should be encouraged to take actions on their own even if it leads to small errors. By doing this, the employees develop self-confidence which is very important for the organization development and for their own personal development. And the last is Esprit de Corps. Managers should try to build team spirit amongst the subordinates. This helps in work harmony and reduces conflict of interest. Now we will discuss upon the other principles of management. After discussing FIOL's 14 principles of management, we shall now be discussing some other principles of management given by other management thinkers and researchers. The first being principles of objective. This principle was given by Coons O'Donnell. According to him, all organizational activities must be coordinated in such a way that they all lead to the achievement of overall organizational goal. Second, principle of span of control. This principle was given by Urvik. According to him, a superior manager or a boss can supervise only a limited number of subordinates. As the number of subordinates increase, the efficiency of the manager to manage and control the subordinates decreases. The third being principle of balance. This principle was also given by Urvik. According to him, all activities in an organization should be well balanced. Imbalance in activities will lead to inefficiency and waste of resources. The fifth one, principle of coordination. This principle was given by Muni and Reli. According to them, all activities and actions of an organization should be orderly arranged. Uncoordinated arrangement will lead to chaos and ultimately failure in achieving the organizational goal. The next being principle of exception. This principle was given by Taylor and other management thinker. According to them, the manager or boss should delegate the unimportant and easy task to his subordinates and keep with him tasks that are strategic, important and difficult to perform. In other words, the task which cannot be done by others can be done by the managers. The next is principle of supportive relationship. This principle was given by Likert. According to him, managers or bosses should provide all kinds of support to their subordinates. The support can be moral, social or psychological. Next, we will be discussing upon the functions of management. After discussing the principles of management, we shall now discuss the functions of management. This is what managers do. There are two approaches to managerial performance, the functions approach and the activities approach. We shall now discuss these approaches in detail. The first being functions approach. In every organization, there are certain basic functions that are performed by all managers. These are functions that are pervasive and universal in nature. They are functions which managers at all levels and in all kinds of organizations perform. They are as follows. Planning. It is a function of determining the objectives and goals of the organization and choosing the appropriate course of action from various alternatives in order to achieve the goals. Next. Organizing. 
After planning, the next step for the manager is to organize. They coordinate and bring together various organizational resources that is human and physical to use them effectively and efficiently to accomplish the goals. The next being leading. The manager is like a leader who has to lead his team consisting of his subordinates in order to achieve the organizational objective. Next, controlling. The manager's work does not finish with planning, organizing and leading. He has also to monitor the working of his subordinates so that they do not go astray from realizing the organizational goals. Next, we will discuss upon the activities approach or role approach. In 1960, Henry Min's work gave 10 roles of managers which were put under three broad categories namely interpersonal roles, informational roles and decisional roles. These roles in detail are discussed below. The first interpersonal roles. The interpersonal roles are further divided into three roles namely figurehead role. Managers play father figure to their subordinates by attending social functions of their subordinates like wedding, rewarding them with certificates and bonuses for their good work. Next, leadership role. Managers hire, train and motivate their subordinates. They guide them in achieving their organizational goals. Next, liaison role. Managers act as a connecting link between the organization and the outside world. Also, there are a link between various organizational departments and units. Informational roles. The informational roles are further divided into three roles, namely monitor role. A manager keeps a check on the changing environment both within and outside the organization. He keeps himself updated with the change in customer's taste, technology and competition. Next, disseminator role. The manager keeps his subordinate informed about the changes happening in the environment by sharing information with them. Next, spokesperson role. Managers are representatives and ambassadors of their organization as they speak on its behalf with the outside world. Decisional roles. The decisional roles are further divided into four roles namely entrepreneur role. Like an entrepreneur, the manager also coordinates various factors of production like land, labor and capital to achieve organizational goal. Next, disturbance handler role. Managers take care of disturbances like strikes, lockouts, employee grievances, shortage of material or any other calamity. Resource allocator role. Managers are responsible for resource allocation that is land, labor and capital. Next, negotiator role. A manager's most crucial role is to run the organization smoothly. Hence, they act as negotiators between parties who are in conflict. Management is essentially an art of getting things done through people. We have just seen the various functions and roles played by managers in getting things done from people working in an organization. A manager cannot do this without having a good knowledge about the behavior of his subordinates. Hence, in the following paragraphs, we shall be trying to study and understand the individual and group behavior of individuals working in an organization. Now, we will discuss upon individual behavior. Individual behavior can be studied by studying the four parameters on which the individual behavior depends. These parameters are personality, attitude, learning and perception. The first being personality. Personality has been derived from the Latin word personer which means to speak through. It means how people influence others through their speech, appearances and actions. In academics, Personality is defined as one's external appearances and behavior and one's awareness about inner self. Next are the determinants of personality. Let us now look into the various determinants of personality. Biological factor. 
One's personality, especially appearance and thought process is to a great extent determined by the biological factors like heredity, brain and the physical features. Next, cultural factors. These are personality traits which one acquires from the environment one lives in. It is a mix of values and beliefs which are transferred from one generation to the next generation. Next, social factors. These are personality traits which one acquires from its immediate family, friends and relatives. This is transmitted through socialization. Next, situational factors. Personal experiences vary from person to person and also from situation to situation. The process of most of the learning experiences is product of situations. Hence, situations both positive and negative have a direct impact on shaping the personality of an individual. Now we will study about the various theories of personality. Over the years, various management thinkers and researchers have evolved personality theories. They can be easily classified into five broad headings which are as follows. First is intrapsychic theory. This is also called the Freudian theory as it was given by a world famous psychologist Sigmund Freud. According to him, a human mind consists of three structures which affect the personality of an individual. These three constructs are ID, Ego and Super Ego. ID consists of feelings in human mind which one inherits by birth like enjoying pleasure and avoiding pain. Ego is reality oriented which human mind acquires from the experiences of life. Like fire is harmful as it can burn the body in close contact, super ego is the idealism which is created in the human mind by getting influenced by one's teachers, parents, films and good books. This creates values and morals within an individual. Hence, the human personality is a mix of ID, ego and superego. The predominance of a particular state explains the personality characteristics of an individual leading to understanding of his or her behavioral pattern of life. The next theory is the type theory. There are two types of type theory, one given by William Sheldon and the other given by Carl Jung. The first one is the Sheldon's theory of psychonomy. According to Sheldon, there are three kinds of body types that individuals have, endomorph, mesomorph and ectomorph. Endomorph individuals are thick. They are fat and bulky in proportion of their height. They are very often very fond of food, are jovial, affectionate and are public favorites. The mesomorph individuals are strong and athletic. They run well, are aggressive and have a bright smile. The ectomorph individuals are physically weak. They are often thin, absent-minded, aloof, shy but intelligent and at times genius. Mostly human beings are a mixture of all these three types. The next theory is the Jung's theory of extrovert and introvert. According to Jung, there are two categories of human personality, extrovert and introvert. Extroverts are individuals who are optimistic, outgoing and are very social. On the other hand, introverts are individuals who are inner driven. They are not social but shy and withdrawn in their own life. In reality, people are neither purely extrovert nor totally introvert. They are a mix of these two personality traits. The next theory is the trait theory. Trait theory is an extension of type theory. Instead of types, the trait theory believes that individuals can be described in terms of traits. There are two types of trait theory, one given by Gordon Allport and the other by Raymond Cattle. Allport's trait theory. According to Allport, human personalities can be compared on the basis of six categories of values. These values are social, political, religious, theoretical, economic and aesthetic. All individuals have a mix of these values. Like some may attach high value to economic, 
and low to others and vice versa. The next is Cattell's trait theory. According to Cattell, human personality can be divided into two categories, surface traits and source traits. These two traits are like the medical cause for a particular symptom. Source trait is like the cause and surface trait is like this symptom. An individual's source trait may be dominating or shy and his surface trait may be expressive or submissive. The next is the social learning theory. Unlike the trait theory, the social learning theory assumes that the personality of an individual is determined by situations. Hence, a person's action in a given situation depends on the characteristics of the situation. When the situation encountered are relatively stable, then the individual behavior is also more stable and consistent. If the situation is unstable and diverse, the behavior also tends to become inconsistent. Hence, the situations in life affect the personality of individuals. The next theory is the self theory. Self theory was given by Carl Rogers and according to him, there are three elements of personality. The self concept, the organism and the development of self. The self consists of the perceptions, ideas and values that characterize the I and me in an individual. The organism is the locus of experiences that an individual undergoes in his life. The development of self personality is the motivating force that makes an individual move towards self actualization and self enhancement. An individual's personality is a combination of all these three elements. Now we will discuss about attitude. An attitude is the predisposition of an individual to evaluate some object in a favorable or an unfavorable manner. They are the human feelings, thoughts and behavioral tendencies towards objects and situations. Characteristics of attitude. We shall now discuss the characteristics of attitude. Attitude comprises of four characteristics, valence, multiplicity, relation to needs and centrality. The first is valence. Valence refers to an individual's magnitude of degree of pleasantness or unpleasantness towards an object or situation. In case an individual is indifferent towards an object, then his valence is low. In case the individual has high feeling of pleasantness or unpleasantness towards the object, then his valence is high. Second B, multiplicity. Multiplicity refers to the number of elements that constitute an attitude. For example, one student may just show interest in studies. On the other hand, other students may show interest in several things like studies, games and dramatics. The third being relation to needs. Attitudes of individual may vary in relation to the needs they serve. For example, for some doing a job is for monetary security and for some it may be a path to self enhancement. The last centrality. Centrality means the degree of importance an individual attaches to an object. The attitudes which have high centrality are less likely to change. Now we will discuss upon the components of attitudes. The structure of a person's attitude consists of three components namely affective, cognitive and overt. The first being affective component. The affective component of an individual's attitude is his feelings or emotions which are associated with an object. Examples are love, hate, likes, dislikes, etc. The second being cognitive component. The cognitive component of an individual's attitude is his beliefs about an object. Examples are good, bad, desirable, undesirable, etc. The third being overt component. The overt component of an individual's attitude is his intention to behave towards a particular object. Both effective that is feelings and cognitive that is beliefs component affect the overt component of an individual. If a person has a negative feeling and belief about something, 
then he is most likely to behave negatively towards that object. Next, the topic of discussion is learning. Learning is defined as a permanent change in behavior of an individual that happens due to an experience or a reinforced practice. We shall now look into the learning process. Learning process. There is a common belief that behaviors which are duly rewarded are learned and continued and those which are unrewarded are discontinued. Individuals learn new behaviors through any of the four processes which are classical conditioning, operant conditioning, observational learning and cognitive learning. First, classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is passive in nature. In this learning happens in response to a particular situation, stimulus or an event. Second, operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is active in nature. In this learning happens as a result of an effect. If an individual's behavior is rewarded, then he will continue doing it. Whereas if his behavior is punished or is unrewarded, then he will no longer continue doing it. Third, observational learning. Observational learning happens by watching the behavior of others. If others are rewarded for their behavior, then the individual learns the behavior and tries to do the same. The fourth, cognitive learning. Cognitive learning results from classroom teachings. Here, individuals are taught how events and objects are related to each other without actually experiencing them. Next is perception. Perception is a psychological process where individuals select, organize and interpret the stimulations received from the environment into meaningful information. Now, we will discuss upon the steps in perception. The various steps involved in making a perception are selection, organization and interpretation. Selection. There are many stimuli in the environment and it totally depends on the individual to pick the stimuli which he considers relevant. Hence, he has to be selective in choosing the appropriate stimuli. Next, organization. Once the individual has selected his stimuli or perceived inputs, he organizes them into a meaningful picture. Next is interpretation. Interpretation is the explanation or analysis of the perceived output or the meaningful picture. Interpretation of individuals may differ as it is highly judgmental and subjective. Now we will discuss upon the factors influencing perception. There are two sets of factors that affect an individual's perception. These are internal factors and external factors. Internal factors. Internal factors are internal to an individual. They are the needs of an individual, his desires, his personality and his experiences. The next is the external factors. Perception of an individual is also influenced especially by the characteristics of outside objects, events and people. Now we will discuss upon group behavior. A group is a collection of two or more people who work together to achieve a common goal in an organization. It is very important for a manager to understand the individual behavior of the subordinates as well as the group dynamics in which they are working. Apart from the formal groups which are based on individual's role in an organization, there are also informal groups which are based on trust and friendship among employees working in an organization. Understanding the group behavior is quite necessary for being a successful and a good manager. To understand the dynamics of a group, it is very important for the manager to have proper understanding and clarity of the various elements comprising a group. Now we will discuss upon the elements of group behavior. The following are the elements of group behavior. First, interaction. Interaction between group members can be face to face or in writing, through letters and emails or through telephone or any other form which allows communication between them. Second being size. A group should have a minimum of two members and there is no limit to maximum. 
However, more the members, more complex the group relationship becomes. Third, shared goal interest. All the group members share a common goal and work together to accomplish the goal. Fourth, collective identity. Each individual identifies himself with the group he is working for. Instead of working in isolation, he works as a team. Fifth, group types. There are various kinds of groups which are listed below. Apathetic group. These groups comprise of people who are low paid and are low skilled and do not work in unity and are often discontent. Women as workers who work from home for organizations are part of such groups. For example, women making papad and achar from home for a company. The next is erratic group. These groups comprise of people who are semi-skilled but like to work in unity. However, they have erratic relationship with the management. Workers working on machines in a factory are examples of such groups. The next is strategic group. These groups comprise of skilled people who like to work in unity. They are productive and are very crucial in an organization. People who work as a group on a project in order to achieve a single objectives are examples of such group. The next is conservative group. These groups comprise of highly skilled people who are very confident and work at the top level of an organization. They are highly productive and crucial for the success and failure of an organization. The board of directors is the best example of such groups. Summary. Principles are statements or truth that provide guidance for human thinking. The characteristics of management principles are dynamic, generalizations, relative and universal. Henry Fiol gave 14 principles of management. The 14 principles of management are division of work, authority and responsibility, discipline, unity of command, unity of direction, subordination of individual interest to general interest, remuneration, centralization, scalar chain hierarchy, order, equity, stability of tenure of personnel, initiative and esprit de corps. Other principles of management are principle of objective, principle of span of control, principle of balance, principle of coordination, principle of exception and principle of supportive relationship. There are two approaches to managerial performance, the functions approach and the activities approach. The various functions of a manager are planning, organizing, leading and controlling. The various roles of manager are interpersonal role, informational role and decisional role. Individual behavior can be studied by studying the four parameters on which the individual behavior depends. These parameters are personality, attitude, learning and perception. Personality has been derived from the Latin word personer, which means to speak through. It means how people influence others through their speech, appearances and actions. The determinants of personality are biological factors, cultural factors, social factors and situational factors. The various theories of personality are intrapsychic theory, type theory and trait theory, social learning theory and self theory. An attitude is the predisposition of an individual to evaluate some object in a favorable or an unfavorable manner. The characteristics of attitudes are valence, multiplicity, relation to needs and centrality. The components of attitudes are affective, cognitive and overt. Learning is defined as a permanent change in behavior of an individual that happens due to an experience or a reinforced practice. Learning process consists of classical conditioning, operant conditioning, observational learning and cognitive learning. Perception is a psychological process where individuals select, organize and interpret the stimulations received from the environment into meaningful information. There are two factors that affect an individual's perception. These are internal factors and external factors. A group is a collection of two or more people 
who work together to achieve a common goal in an organization. The elements of group behavior are interaction, size, shared goal interest, collective identity and group types.